Welcome to the Institute of Catholic Culture, a nonprofit Catholic organization dedicated to the re-evangelization of our society through educational and cultural programs offered to the public at no charge. This and other presentations, hundreds of hours of audio, are available for free on our website, www.instituteofcatholicculture.org. There you can listen to or download educational programs related to all aspects of our divine faith, and you can review our schedule of upcoming events. We hope you can join us in person. The handout reference during this presentation is available for download on the audio section of our website. Okay, if we could all stand, we'll begin in prayer. Through the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, and thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. As we forgive those trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. To the prayers of our Holy Fathers, Lord Jesus Christ, our God, have mercy on us and save us. Amen. Thank you all for coming tonight. I affectionately call this series my Knock Knock Who's There series. <laughs> we have a lot to get through tonight. What do you say to a Jehovah's Witness when they knock on your door? And then we will be turning our microphones over to Mr. Aaron Green, who is a former Jehovah's Witness convert to the Catholic Church, and he's going to share with us his story. Again, a very short 15 to 20 minutes. So we're going to try to break this up, and we'll move on and try to uh, get you out of this room as quickly as possible and back to your doors where you can finally answer them. If you don't have a Bible with you tonight, Catholics, shame on you. You are a prime candidate for conversion to the Watchtower. I'm not I'm serious about that because they will knock on your door and if you love Jesus Christ, you will open your door to them and they will find what they hope to find and that is a Catholic who is not ready to give a defense for the faith that they hold. You will be presented, possibly for the first time in your life, with someone who believes in God and who loves God and loves what they're doing and believes that God has called them to convert the world. How many of us could say the same about our own life. So I encourage you over the next three weeks, bring your Bibles. If you don't know where it is, go find it. If you can't find it, buy one and start reading. Our topic tonight, Jehovah's Witnesses. Our topic next week, Seventh-day Adventists. And our topic on the third week, Mormons. Uh, Like I said, tonight we have a convert. And on the third week, we also have a gentleman who's converted from uh, Mormonism to the Catholic Church, and he will be speaking, and we are currently trying to track down a Seventh-day Adventist. We'll do the best we can and see what happens. Tonight, I want to just begin with a little introduction about cults. What is a cult? The word is traditionally used to refer to simply a way of worship. Traditionally, the cult of the Catholic Church is a proper use of that term, not in a derogatory manner in the slightest. However, in the last 50 or 60 years, this word has begun to be used in a little bit of a negative way to identify certain groups which use a number of tactics to attack the rational faculties of man and also his free will. And it's really there that we want to look to understand who it is that's knocking on our door on Saturday morning. Because we have to know who the person is that we might be able to give the right answer for the faith that we hold. Because we may give a very reasoned answer and never go past first base with them. As has happened to me many times, becoming extremely frustrated. I've had to go to confession a number of times. Because when you're using basic reasoned arguments and you can't go from A to B... It's extremely frustrating, and I've gotten in in yelling matches with people, huh? While they're driving out my driveway. (laughs) So, the word cult is a very subjective term used today. Many Protestants will use the word in its negative manner to refer to Roman Catholics or to Catholics. Why? Because we set oral tradition next to written tradition, and therefore we place, as they see it, the traditions of man or the the words of men against the words of God. And so there's different 
ideas that could fit to be able to identify what a cult is. The Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Seventh-day Adventists are all going to have different aspects which we're concerned about. But I want to give you a couple identifying factors that could be helpful. They often use intimidation or psychological manipulation to keep members loyal to their ranks. Some ideas, it's a list I found, I did a little bit of searching on the web, trying to even form in my own mind, what are these identifying factors that are important for us? They use the practice oftentimes of shunning. Members will be expected to give substantial financial support to the group. And coercive methods of guilt are used oftentimes. There's great emphasis, and, and this is very true about the Jehovah's Witnesses I've found, there's great emphasis on loyalty to the group and its teachings, which we can say very much about the Catholic Church, but the lives of members will be totally absorbed into the group's activities. They will have little or no time to think for themselves because of physical or emotional exhaustion. This is very true. To be a Jehovah's Witness is to, to, to live a very demanding life. And I've oftentimes become frustrated when I ask them to please read something, as they ask me to read something, but they literally don't have time to do it. Any dissent or question of the group's teachings is discouraged. Criticism in any form is seen as a rebellion. There's a certain abuse of individuality. They're not permitted to think for themselves apart from the group. An abuse of intimacy, relationship with friends, relatives, spouses, children, parents are broken or seriously hampered. Abuse of finances, we already mentioned that. An us versus them mentality. In other words, everybody in the group is okay, but every single person on the outside is from the devil. Abuse of time and energy, I mentioned that. And abuse of free will. They must unquestionably submit to the group's teachings and directions and their own free will is broken. Their will actually becomes the group's will without their realizing it. Okay, so some ideas that might be helpful for you as you're answering that door and opening that door. I want you to also realize when you open your door to a Jehovah's Witness, and this goes with Seventh-day Adventists and Mormons also, that you're opening the door to someone who is made in the image and likeness of God. Someone who is not desiring your destruction in any way. They're seeking your good. And so you have to assume goodwill when you're speaking with them. Jehovah's Witnesses, a quick outline or uh, overview of their history. To find the history of the Jehovah's Witness, we have to go back to a man who lived in the 19th century. His name was William Miller. We'll speak more about William Miller next week. He was the beginning or the founder of what we call the Millerite movement. William Miller, using the prophecies of the book of Daniel, prophesied the second coming or advent of Christ in 1844. His group would eventually form in, in different areas, but his main group as the Seventh-day Adventists. The Adventist movement, prophesying the end in 1844, really was, became an international movement. He used the publication of periodicals, of magazines, of tracts, and distributed them widely. And people began in different Protestant sects to join him, not leaving necessarily their Protestant sect because there wasn't obviously Adventist church set up, but taking on these ideas and taking them home to their different Baptists or uh, Methodists or Lutheran churches. When 1844 came and 1844 went, William Miller faced a problem, okay, obviously. And he suddenly invented a new doctrine, the doctrine of the new light. He received new light from God that actually Jesus Christ had not returned when he had expected in the spring of 1844, but he would come in the fall of 1844. And yet, he had not contradicted his former prophecy because he said that Christ had moved into the second chamber of the Holy of Holies in heaven. And that's the vision he had seen. And now Christ was going to return in the fall of 1844. Unfortunately for Miller, Christ did not return in 1844. And his followers dispersed infiltrated back into their regular Protestant churches, carrying with them these Adventist ideas. And it wasn't uncommon then to hear Adventist preaching that Armageddon, the end was coming soon, in many of our Protestant churches, as these pastors held on to these different Adventist ideas. 
One of the men that was carrying these ideas from 1844 was a man named Nelson Barber. Nelson Barber had followed these predictions and attempted a new prophecy. And the prophecy was that Christ would return in 1878. Nelson, writing a number of tracts, was read by a man named Charles Taze Russell. Charles Taze Russell is the founder of the Watchtower, or the Jehovah's Witnesses. Russell was a very wealthy man, and at 18 years old, he had control of his father's chain of clothing stores, which he, becoming convinced of Barber's date, four years in the future, sold the clothing stores for the handsome sum of $300,000, the equivalent of something like $7 million today. Uh, As you can imagine, Nelson Barber became quick friends with Charles Taze Russell, and the two began publishing his prophecies and his calculations through, again, a number of these tracts and periodicals. When 1878 arrived, and Christ did not, Russell and Barber had a, uh, say, an argument. Barber received new light, and so did Russell. Unfortunately, their new light did not agree. And Russell went his own way with his finances, and he founded the Zion Watchtower and Herald of Christ's Presence magazine, and began to publish his teachings there. Teachings which were really gained from other, other ideas that were floating around at the time. Russell really didn't come with, with too much that was brand new. He was grabbing, taking from different Adventist ideas at the time. He believed that when Christ came, he would take 144,000 men and women to heaven with him, and the rest of the holy people of God would remain on earth. And this is still a teaching of the Jehovah's Witnesses today. He rejected the idea of the Trinity. He accepted a form of what we might call adoptionism. He says in his studies on the scriptures, moreover, the very words Father and Son imply a difference and contradict the thoughts of the Trinity and oneness of person. And oneness of person. Okay, this doctrine of three gods in one God is one of the dark mysteries by which Satan, through the papacy, has beclouded the word and character of the plan of God. Notice, he twists the doctrine of the Trinity from three persons in one God, and he mentions three gods in one God. This is still true, you'll find, in Watchtower publications today. They will oftentimes misconstrue the the doctrine of the Trinity intentionally so as to confuse the people that they're finding at the door that are usually not well versed in the teachings on the Trinity. Russell also believed that the great pyramid in Giza in Egypt was built by the hands of God himself and contained in it all of the measurements that would tell us about the future coming of the end of the world. He took those measurements and made a number of prophecies based upon them. One being that the world would end now, not in 1878, but in 1910. Unfortunately for Russell, when 1910 came and 1910 went, he was left struggling to find an answer. He re-prophesied, receiving new light from God. If you're starting to shake your head already... Trust me, I've got a lot more material to cover. That Christ would return in 1914. Of course, 1914 came, and with it, what great event upon the earth? World War I. Just the answer that Russell needed. Russell, by the time 1914 ended, had to receive new light and proclaimed that Christ had come, yes, in 1914, but not as the men had expected. He had come invisibly and was to return visibly in 1915. Unfortunately, again, the world did not end in 1915, and Russell readjusted his calculation to 1918. Well, the end did come, but not in 1918. It came in 1916, when our good Lord took Russell from us. (laughs) He was succeeded by a man named Joseph Rutherford. 
Joseph Rutherford held to the 1914 date and became famous for the phrase, millions now living will never die. Millions now living will never die. That is a, a phrase that the Jehovah's Witnesses held on to all the way until 1995. The, the generation alive in 1914, those that were at least born in 1914, would not die. In other words, the end would come before the end of that generation. He was a Zionist, that the Jews should be returned to Palestine. He rejected the doctrine of the existence of hell. And in 1881, he founded Zion's Watchtower and Tract Society. Joseph Rutherford, or what he came to be known as Judge Rutherford, he filled in, he was a lawyer, and he filled in one time as a judge in a, in a case where the judge was sick and he couldn't make it, and so he took the term for himself, Judge Rutherford, also had some prophecy problems. He began by prophesying that the patriarchs, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and the other patriarchs would return in 1925 to prepare for that date he built a house in San Diego, California. How many of you have been to San Diego, California? It's nice, isn't it? Well, Joseph Rutherford thought it was nice too. He built a gorgeous mansion. He bought a fleet of beautiful black luxury vehicles. And between the time of his election and 1925, he, of course, being a good Christian, did not want the house to go to waste. And so he moved in himself and used the fleet of vehicles to drive around with, and ended up living his life out there and dying there at a house called Beth Sarim, the House of Princes. Rutherford was succeeded uh, in 1942 by a man named Nathan Knorr. Knorr is responsible, really, for the training of Jehovah's Witnesses as really expert evangelists. I want you to know, and, and be, get this in your head, when you meet a Jehovah's Witness at the door, don't stand there pridefully and say, this is someone who's involved in some nonsense cult. This is a person who is highly trained to meet you. They are trained to meet Catholics at the door. So if you think you're going to open the door with Bible in hand and suddenly have a convert on your hands, you've got another thing coming. Russell had sent his missionaries out with phonographs or record players with his preaching on it. And they would go to the door, knock, knock, knock. Would you like to listen? Of course, in those days, that would have been a pretty nice treat. And they would sit down and listen to his preaching. But Nor did not think that was the future of the Watchtower. And so he began a systematic training of the people. They would be prepared to go door to door. Nor also began a new translation called the New World Translation which you can pick up. I'm sure they'd be happy to give you one at the door. If they ask for a donation, I would not give it. But um, you might be able to pick one of these up in a used bookstore. This is not the Bible. The Bible, or the so-called Bible that they have in their hands at the door, is not the Bible you have in your bookshelf. Do not be tricked. Because they will come in, they will open their Bible, and they will have you read a doctrine which you did not know existed, because it doesn't exist. Okay? <laughs> He had a number of men, five in all, who translated the scriptures, um, by all accounts totally unprepared to do so, and produced what we have today as a New World Translation. It's gone through a number of revisions. Nor quickly became convinced that World War II would mark the end of the world in 1948. You know what happened. And once that did not take place, he changed his date to 1975. 1975 became a very important date for the Jehovah's Witnesses, basing his calculations on the date of the creation of Adam. When 1975 drew close, I'll read you just two quick quotes. The Watchtower was teaching at the time. Do not pursue higher education. There is very little time left. Make pioneer service the full-time ministry with the possibility of Bethel or missionary service your goal. Another text. Reports are heard of brothers selling their homes and property and planning to finish out the rest of their days in this old system in pioneer service. Certainly, this is a fine way to spend the short time remaining before the wicked world ends. Okay, this was in 1974. It's very sad because people sold everything they had. They didn't go to school. They didn't get married. Their life was changed. And it's not uncommon today to find 
among the Jehovah's Witnesses really kind of a middle class, a lower class existence. Not, nothing wrong with that of carpenters and plumbers. This was the way because they did not go on for further education, sadly. In 1976, by the time they realized they had a problem on their hands, the Watchtower published this. But it is not advisable for us to set our sights on a certain date. If anyone has been disappointed through not following this line of thought, he should now concentrate on adjusting his viewpoint, seeing that it was not the word of God that failed or deceived him and brought disappointment, but that his own understanding was based on wrong premises. In other words, it's your fault. A classic mark of a cult. Nor passed from our existence, and Frederick Franz followed him in 1977. The last prophecy the Jehovah's Witnesses really kind of pushed, but not quite as hard as they had pushed the 75 date, was uh, the year 2000. Um, But they quickly adjusted that date also. They have now moved away from their generation of 1914 that would not pass away, and are simply telling the people that the Armageddon is coming soon. Okay, And so you have to realize that the people are preparing themselves for the end of the world and seriously doing so. And that is why they're willing to give up full-time jobs. That's why they're willing to spend 10, uh, 15 hours, sometimes more, a week going door to door. And you have to realize that. Among its stranger doctrines, that Christ was not crucified on a cross, but he was nailed to a stake us versus them mentality, setting themselves against all of Christendom. They refused to celebrate Christmas, saying that December 25th was not the date of Christ's birth. They refused to celebrate birthdays because it was on Herod's birthday that John the Baptist's head was severed from his body. They reject blood transfusions because the Old Testament tells us that we should not consume blood. They refuse to honor the flag and refuse military service because, of course, all governments are of men and therefore of the devil. Some of their more dangerous doctrines, as I've mentioned, is the refusal of the doctrine of the Trinity. Their belief that before the incarnation, Jesus was Michael the archangel. And that after the resurrection, he became Michael the archangel again in some really twisted kind of way. The Holy Spirit is not a person, but a force. A rejection of the soul and of the immortality of man. When you die, you cease to exist. And of course, the use of the magic name Jehovah. All of these are important doctrines. My brother is going to now step up here for a few minutes and talk to you about some apologetic points. Again, you're going to have to take what we're saying tonight, and if you want to prepare yourself, open that door, fine. Make a time to meet again, and you spend your week in between preparing yourself to give a reasoned answer for the faith that you hold. Amen? Amen. Okay. My brother, Subdeacon Sebastian, please give him a warm welcome. Okay, how many people brought their Bibles? Hold them up. Let me see. Oh, that's pretty good. All right. Anybody that didn't... How many people did not bring a Bible? Raise your hand. Okay, so we know there's Catholics in the room. All right, that's good. That's a bad joke, by the way. That shouldn't be a joke, right? Okay. okay, so you heard about the history of the Jehovah's Witnesses. Obviously, it was a very quick overview. Some really important points that you heard, and we're going to cover or talk about those briefly as well. How do they use the Bible to support some of these false doctrines or some of these erroneous teachings? We're going to look at two of the most important ones. There are a lot of them that you typically think of with Jehovah's Witnesses. The name Jehovah, big deal. You think about that, you hear them, well, we have the name Jehovah, and you should be using the name Jehovah. The handout you have, the packet that you got when you came in, the third piece of paper deals with that, the Hebrew and the Greek text. We don't have time to deal with that tonight. If you want to come talk to me afterwards, if you're currently talking to a Jehovah's Witness, or this is something that's interesting to you, the name Jehovah, you can come and talk to me, and we'll go over that Hebrew and Greek text. We're going to talk about two very important points, though. Though the word Jehovah in the 144,000, these are things we typically associate with Jehovah's Witnesses. The two really significant errors they have is the denial of the Trinity and the denial of the immortality of man. Those are really foundational, significant for a lot of their other teachings. So we're going to focus on those because we have so little time. Where do they come with this idea that Jesus is Michael the Archangel? Well, open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangels call, with the sound of the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. You hear that? Look at that again. Verse 16. For the Lord Himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the archangels call, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. So if Christ is going to come with the voice or the sound, phone in Greek, it's the same word. You can translate either way. Some translations have sound, some have the call, some have the voice. If he comes with the voice of the archangel, well, I come with my voice usually. I didn't come up here and speak with my brother's voice, although we might sound similar. Uh, If I came with the voice of Ronald Reagan, who would I be? Either a ventriloquist or some sort of a magician, or I'm Ronald Reagan, right? You can see the reasoning here. Jesus is going to come in his second coming with the voice of the archangel. Now, how do they get to Michael the archangel, though? How about a Michael? Well, in the Bible, there's only one archangel that's named. And that's in Jude. If you hold your hand there to Thessalonians, just keep your hand in Thessalonians and flip over to the second to last book of the Bible, just before Revelation. You have a little tiny book called Jude. So small, just one chapter. Jude 9. But when the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, disputed about the body of Moses, he did not presume to pronounce a reviling judgment upon him, but said, The Lord rebuke you. Michael, the archangel. So the Jehovah's Witness reasons, well, if the archangel, if there's only one archangel mentioned in the Bible, uh, or given a name, there must only be one archangel, and his name is Michael. And if Jesus comes with the voice of the archangel, then Jesus must be coming with the voice of Michael. Therefore, Jesus is Michael. You see? You know, well, wait a minute. That, I, I can see that somewhat, but that sounds a little like you're kind of stretching it. And it is stretching it, of course. This is a new doctrine or a new idea in the history of Christianity. What's going on here? Well, flip back to 1 Thessalonians. What's wrong with the argument? 1 Thessalonians. What's it about? Who wrote it? Who's the audience? These are the things we want to think about when we read some part of the Bible. Paul was writing this to the Thessalonians. This is his first letter that was ever written. This is the first piece of the New Testament ever composed. 1 Thessalonians. And Paul was in Thessalonica. He converted the, the Jews in Thessalonica, and then he had to leave in the middle of the night because the synagogue, the local synagogue, was persecuting him. And he fled, he went down south to Athens, eventually to Corinth. And then he wrote these letters, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, to finish up some questions and answers that the Thessalonians had. Okay? Timothy brought, came down later and said, Paul, you've got to write a letter up there. The Thessalonians, they're wondering. There's been a problem. A couple of the people in the community have died. And they're wondering, you had said that Jesus was coming back. What happens with uh, you know, this guy who died? Will he miss Jesus? Paul says, no. Let me tell you what's going to happen when Jesus comes back. So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 is intended to answer for the Thessalonian community that question, what about the people in the community who have already died, and what will happen to them when Jesus comes? Will they miss him? So 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 13. Always read the whole paragraph. But we would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those who are asleep, that you may not grieve as others do who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so through Jesus... God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep. For this we declare to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive, who are left, until the coming of the Lord, shall not precede those who have fallen asleep. Verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with the cry of command, with the archangel's call, and the blast of a trumpet. So what is Paul trying to tell them here? That when Jesus comes, the guy who died, he's going to wake up. Jesus is going to come back. What's the image here? Like a king coming to his city. The king always comes with a herald before him, a trumpeter, and a herald before him announcing, here comes the king. So he says, don't worry about the guy that died. Because when Jesus comes, it's going to be like a king coming to his city. Everyone in the city knows. And furthermore, those guys are going to wake up. It's going to be so loud. The alarm clock's going to go off, and they will ascend into the heavens, and we will ascend with them and meet Christ in the air in the second coming. That's the intention of Paul in 1 Thessalonians, not to teach you that Jesus is my clear angel. Now, what's going on in Jude 9? The same thing. Jude is not intending to teach you that Michael and Jesus are the same thing. He's trying to talk to you about the ascension of Moses. 
the assumption of Moses' body, and the wrestling between Michael the archangel and Satan. A battle. Again, it has nothing to do with the context of what we're talking about here. All right. Now, there are other passages in the New Testament that clearly teach, furthermore, that Jesus is not an angel and that he is God. Hebrews chapter 1. Hebrews is intended for a community that was wondering about the nature of Jesus. How helpful here. So, wondering, maybe Jesus is kind of, maybe he was an angel. So, this letter is written in part to answer that very question. Very helpful. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 5, he says this, For to what angel did God ever say, Thou art my son, today I begotten thee? Or again, I will be him a father, and he shall be to me a son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all God's angels, all God's angels worship him. Notice the angels are something distinct. Let all God's angels worship him. Verse 7, of the angels, he says, who makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the Son, he says, thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. So you can hear chapter 1 of Hebrews is intended to answer this very question. What is the nature of Jesus? And he's clearly showing them that Jesus is not an angel. He's the Son of God. Now, there are also passages in the New Testament, and way too many for us to look at tonight, but some key passages that you should make sure you're aware of for proving or know, uh, clearly seeing G the divinity of Jesus. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, why doesn't a Jehovah's Witness read that? Well, they do. Unfortunately, as my brother mentioned, they're reading it in an er erroneous translation. Okay? So it doesn't say what that said, what I just read for you. So in your Bibles, and Catholics and Protestants will oftentimes turn a Jehovah's Witness to this passage at the door. And they go, well, I've got them here. But no, you don't. When they open up their Bible and they say, why don't you read my Bible and see what it says? Something different. It says, rather, in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. Little g, a God. And the Catholic or the Protestant looks at their Bible and says, why does it say that? And they say, well, it's because that's what it says in the Greek. The Greek. Oh, yes, let me explain to you. In the Greek text, you see there's an article, the, before God, in the first occurrence. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the God. That's Jehovah. And the Word was God. No article there in the Greek. And so, therefore, he's indefinite. A little God. A God. Kind of like an angel. All right? Well... You can now pull out for your firm when they come to the door the Greek text. If you look at the next page there I've given you in the handout, the Greek text that they have not seen themselves, but are just telling you what they heard. I know you don't read Greek. It's okay. Just settle down. Don't, don't get nervous. We're just going to go through. Just look for word for word, okay? And I've made, I've made some points on here so you can see it. Make sure you have the page that says John 1 at the top. You see that? Okay. In arche in hologos. In the beginning was the word, comma, ke hologos and the word in pros ton theon. You see that box there? I boxed in the article for you. And that's what the Jehovah's Witness is pointing out to you. Okay? Now look at the comma. Ke theos in hologos. And God was the word. Notice no article there. I put a box, an empty box for you. You see their argument? Okay? Now look at the next line. Hutos, this one, ain in arche pros ton theon. This one was in the beginning with the God. Okay, capital G in those places. But what about this one that doesn't have the article? So you see, you Catholics, you see, you Protestants. And this is the argument they use. Okay. Well, the Jehovah's Witness doesn't know Greek either. And so you can have some confidence when they ask you this in the door. They don't know what they're talking about either. They've been told to say this, okay? And so what you can do is you can show them that actually every other occurrence of the word God in the prologue doesn't have an article in it. And I boxed those in for you. Look at verse 6. Again, it to anthropos, apistomenos. There happened, there was a man who was sent para theu. You see that empty box? Verse 6. This is John the Baptist who was sent from... God, right? Even in the Jehovah's Witness Bible, it says he was sent from God. Big G. But in the Greek text, there's no article there. Why? Well, because this has to do with Greek grammar. 
Greek doesn't use the article the same way that we do in English. And so what's happened is the, the Jehovah's Witnesses, somebody along the line told them, or they discovered this thing, and they said, wow, look at that, there's no article. Okay, that supports our Jesus is the Michael the Archangel theory. But it doesn't. If it does, then they're mistranslating the word God in all these other places, and John the Baptist would have been sent from Jesus. Verse 12, those who see those who know the, the power to become children of God, technotheu, look at that box there again, they'd be up to becoming children of the little God, of Jesus if you're going to follow the reasoning. It doesn't work. All right. If any more questions on that, we can talk about that afterwards. So the Jehovah's Witness is aware of this text, but, and they think they know the answer, but they don't. Okay? So you can help them with that. And recently, Jehovah's Witnesses have started to back away a little bit from this argument, too, because they're starting to become aware of this. The other passage, of course, is important. is in John's Gospel, a number of other passages. Jesus says, I am, using the divine name, and going me throughout John's Gospel. But at the end of John's Gospel, in chapter 20, you can flip over there for a second, Thomas wasn't there the first time after the resurrection. We all know the story. The poor guy gets the name Doubting Thomas from thereafter. Jesus shows up again when Thomas is there. And he says to him in verse 28, Thomas answered him and said, verse 28, My Lord and my God. My Lord and my God. And Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. Even 2,000 years later, in Old Town Alexandria without air conditioning. Right? Here we are. Right? That's what he's talking about. All right, and there's a lot of other passages like this. This is, again, just to show you that they're misusing some of these passages, and then there are clear answers that you can help uh, show the Jehovah's Witness to, to uh, give them some clarity on some of these errors. The other doctrine, their distinctive doctrine, that's really significant for Jehovah's Witnesses is annihilation. You will cease to exist when you die. You will not have an immortal soul. You won't go on to be anywhere. Okay? So, where do they get this idea? It comes out of the Adventist movement, and we'll see that next week the Adventists have their own version of this doctrine. But the Jehovah's Witnesses version is that you will cease to exist at death, and they base it on Ecclesiastes 9.5. If you want to flip back there for a, for a second, Ecclesiastes 9.5. For the living know that they will die, but the dead know nothing. You see? So, how can you, if you're dead and you know nothing, you must have ceased to exist. Right? Ecclesiastes 9.5. The Seventh-day Adventists will use it as well. There's some other passages they'll use to support it, but this is the main one. Ecclesiastes 9.5a, first half of the verse. For the living know that they will die, right? You know that. But the dead know nothing. In fact, it goes on, they have no more reward, the memory of them is lost. Pretty depressing. What's going on? Well, you have to read this in context. In fact, if you read the whole verse, you have a major problem if you're Jehovah's Witness. What do you believe will happen to you when Jehovah God comes and raises you from the dead or recreates you? At the end times, 1914, 1975, whatever date it's going to be, God will recreate all those who have died from his own memory of them. He'll recreate them in the state in which they died and then judge them. Right? And if they were a good Jehovah's Witness, they have the reward. Look what the verse says. There is no more memory of them, and there is no more reward. So if you take the verse, if you take it literally as the Jehovah's Witness is taking the first half, you take the second half, they have a major problem with their very doctrine that they're trying to prove to you. What's Ecclesiastes all about? Solomon is pondering life, the meaning of life. He's had all the wealth. He's had all the women. He's had all the power. He's had all the wisdom. And he realizes that he didn't live every day to the fullness for the glory of God. And he's coming into his life, and he's pondering, what is the meaning of life? It's not gold and wisdom and pleasure and power. It's something else. And so he's saying, look, the man who is alive is so much better off than the man who is dead. He says in the previous verse, a dead dog is better than a dead lion. Right? Look, you compare a lion to a dog. You might think, dog, they're nice. They have a Labrador retriever. In the ancient world, the dogs, these are the mongrel, you know, uh, the, these are the, the thing about a hyena or something, or a jackal. Okay? A living dog is better than a, a dead lion. Right? They, have, they still know what's going to happen, and they still have life left in them to live. That's what he's trying to say here. And again, you're using, there's a lot of hyperbole and things in this uh, wisdom literature. But there are lots of passages in the Bible that talk about the afterlife. Lots of them. 
So, 1 Samuel chapter 28, for example, Saul is about to go to battle the next day with the Philistines. Saul has become an enemy of God. He has failed to keep the commands of God. And Samuel, the prophet, warned him of his error, and then Samuel died. So Saul's about to go to war with the Philistines, and he doesn't know what's going to happen the next day. He doesn't have a prophet to tell him about what's going to happen. And so he goes to the witch of Endor. This is 1 Samuel 28. He goes to the witch of Endor, and he asks her to conjure up uh, Samuel for him. And so she does. And look what happens in verse uh, 9. Uh, sorry, verse 10. Saul swore to her, the Lord as the Lord lives, no punishment shall come upon you. Then verse 11. Then the woman said, whom shall I bring up for you? And he said, bring up Samuel for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she screamed. And Saul said, who do you see? And he said, I see a God coming out of the ground. What is this thing? And Saul knew it was Samuel. Look what it says there. He knew it was Samuel. Verse 14. Saul knew that it was Samuel. Verse 15. Then Samuel said to Saul. Why am I emphasizing this? Yeah, of course, obviously I know the story well. Well, the Jehovah's Witnesses are aware of this passage too. And they say, well, what's going on here is the witch has conjured up a demon who is pretending to be Samuel. But that's not what's going on. Read the text. The inspired text. This is the, narr the narrator telling you the story. The narrator is telling you the story here. Okay? That there is, Samuel has arisen when the woman saw Samuel. When Saul knew that it was Samuel. Verse 15, then Samuel, not someone that looked like Samuel, but Samuel said. You go through the whole passage, you can see this over and over again. This is no demon. And furthermore, when you read what Samuel says, it was the same thing Samuel said when he was alive. He said, Saul, you're in big trouble. You're an enemy of God. So, other passages. In the New Testament, flip over to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. Most of you know this story well, at least better than the previous story we looked at. Luke chapter 16, the rich man and Lazarus. Verse 19, Luke chapter 16, verse 19. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day at his gate. Lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. The poor man died and was carried by angels. Now when you die, what happens to you? You cease to exist. But notice there are angels carrying something that has ceased to exist. Right? And then he goes to the bosom of Abraham, who has not existed for 2,000 years. The rich man also died and was buried, and then he went to Hades, even though he doesn't exist. And then he saw Abraham with eyes, apparently, that don't exist. You can see where this is going. Right? It goes on, it becomes ridiculous. You have a conversation with two people who don't exist. And Lazarus is involved, and he doesn't exist. Right? Well, the Jehovah's Witness is also aware of this passage, but, and they'll say, well, it's a parable. Yeah, but every parable in the Bible is based upon reality in some way, otherwise you wouldn't be able to understand the parable. Right? A man goes out to sow. He sows seed. Right? This is something that you know. Men go out to sow. And this is a symbol of the word of God going out. Right? Or a man plants a vineyard, and he lends it out to tenant farmers. Right? This, this is, all the parables are based in reality. But the Jehovah's Witness wants to tell you, no, see, it's a parable, so it's not based in reality. There's nothing, well, what parable is like that? Okay, so the Jehovah's Witness has a lot of trouble with this. You can look at some other passages as well. I have them there. We don't have to turn to them all. I have marked for you on the handout uh, Philippians 1.23, 1 Peter 3.19. In uh, 2 Corinthians 5.6, Paul talks about going to be with Christ when he dies. He's looking forward to death so he can go to be with Christ. Okay? Also, Revelation chapter 6. John sees a vision. He sees the souls of the martyrs, those who have died for the faith. Now remember, they don't exist. And look what happens in chapter 6, verse 9. And when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God. So he's seen something that doesn't exist, at least for the Jehovah's Witness. And for the witnesses they had borne, and they cried out with a loud voice, even though they don't exist. O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long will thou uh, judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? And then they were each given a white robe, even though they don't exist. Right? So what's going on here? So again, here you have a vision 
of the martyrs under the altar in the heavenly temple awaiting the vengeance of God for those who killed them. Right? And they're given robes also. Jehovah's Witnesses have a lot of trouble with that passage in particular. But how are you going to deal with the Jehovah's Witness when they come to the door? You can flip them around in the Bible, turn passage after passage, and rarely will you ever hear a story of a Jehovah's Witness that became a Catholic or left the watchtower because someone flipped them around the Bible really fast. What they'll conclude from looking at these passages, and you should be able to handle these passages, but what they will conclude is you know the Bible better than they do. And they need to go do some more studying. Because their faith is not based on the scriptures. Their faith is based upon the watchtower. And so what every watch, Jehovah's Witness will tell you, every convert will tell you, is you have to show them the problems and the history of the watchtower. And my brother gave you some of that information. How are you going to get that information when the, when the Jehovah's Witness comes to your door? What do you do when they come to your door? First of all, I gave you some general principles at the bottom of the first page of the handout. General principles of witnessing the witnesses. Become a missionary. Learn their language. Learn their culture. Be a missionary in your own neighborhood. It's going to take work. It's going to take time. Okay? Furthermore, be patient and loving. Colossians chapter 4, 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Always be ready to give a, witness, or a testimony for that which is in your heart, for that's what you believe. But do it in love. Right? The, the face of Christ should shine forth through you to them. You're preaching the gospel to them, remember. You're not trying to convince them of arguments. You're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Number three, it's easier to keep one from getting in than getting out. So if you have a relative or a friend that you hear is studying with witnesses, that's the time to act. Don't wait. Okay? Once they're in, it's very difficult to get them out of a cult. But you can work with them before, uh, you know, before they get in. And there's some techniques for that. Uh, doctrinal history is more important than Bible verses. I already mentioned that. What to do when they come knocking? Someone said to me just before the talk today, someone knocked on their door. Say, hey, Jehovah's Witnesses. What do you do? What do you do from here after today? Well, here's, some, here's a plan of action. Take the literature. Be loving. Be kind. Take the literature that they give you. Ask them about Russell. Who is Russell? Who was he? Ask them a lot of questions about him. Don't get too fiery. Just ask them about Russell. And let them tell you about Russell. Who was he? His importance in the, uh, in the system. Ask for a mission statement and set an appointment for a return. And then close the door. Okay? Then, what are you going to do? You're going to study. There's a lot of resources out there. There's a lot of books, a lot of stuff on the internet. I recommend getting some published things that are uh, high quality you can read and study. And then, at the, and study also Russell. You can get his stuff through Interlibrary Loan. You can buy the stuff on Amazon, used books. I just bought some stuff for pennies off Amazon today. Uh, you can get some of his literature. You can also get it through Interlibrary Loan. And then get the charter of the Watchtower off the web. The actual mission statement. This is the closest thing to a mission statement. The, wa the Watchtower Charter. You can get it on the internet. Okay? Then, when they return, the next meeting, ask them about Russell's Pyramid. This is something they don't hear about anymore. They may hear their parents had talked about it a little bit. They can go back and do the research. You do the research on his pyramid. Find out a little bit about it, like my brother was talking about it. It's in the Studies and Scriptures, Russell's book, and they can get that in their kingdom hall. And they can do a little research when they're at the kingdom hall about the pyramid. And you can ask them about the pyramid. Okay, what was that all about? Then you can also ask them about the charter. You can give them the copy of the charter, which happens to say that the purpose of the watchtower is to promote public Christian worship of Almighty God and... Jesus Christ. Right? But remember, he's an angel. You can't worship angels. So what this is doing is you're showing the Jehovah's Witness the inconsistency of their doctrines in their, in, not only just at the present time, but also in history. And that will help the Jehovah's Witness begin to think. You want them to start to think and to critically examine their own faith and their own religion and their own history of their own watchtower organization. Okay? And that's what Aaron's going to talk to you about right now, is how does a Jehovah's Witness get out of it? And then how does he become a Catholic? What are the things that happen to a Jehovah's Witness that make them go from being the guy at your door to the other side? Okay? And you want to listen to it very carefully because you can learn a lot. What was it? Fancy arguments? No. You'll see. Thank you very much. Mr. Green is going to give a short uh, testimony of the story of his conversion. I want to read you quickly one last verse, and then we'll take our break. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 18. Uh, if the prophet who presumes to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or who speaks in the name of another god, that same prophet shall die. 
And if you say in your heart, how may we know the word which the Lord has not spoken? When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You need not be afraid of him. The Jehovah's Witnesses, the watchtower is a false prophet, clearly. (laughs) And I want you to be prepared to be able to open your door and to give a witness to your faith. But again, I will remind you that the guy answering on the other side of the door is going to be much more prepared than you. And so I want you to be well-rooted. And that's why my brother said, take the literature, make an appointment, close the door, and take some days off of work and get to work learning what they believe and what you believe so you can give a reason to answer your faith. We're going to take a three-minute break and come back with Mr. Aaron Green. Mr. Green has come from long distances flying today to be with us, so I ask you to please give him your attention. Please welcome Mr. Aaron Green. Well, thank you very much. It's a great honor to be here. Uh, It's a great joy to see so many people who are interested in coming and learning more about how to defend the Catholic faith and and how uh, how to respond to Jehovah's Witnesses. And so, as you know, I I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. I was born and raised one for the first 22 years of my life. I served for a number of years as a pioneer. You heard that term before tonight. Those are the ones who go uh, out door to door on average 70 hours a month trying to make converts. And so I can certainly agree that Jehovah's Witnesses do have, uh, they have a good intention. They they feel like they have the truth. In fact, they call it that. You'll probably hear them use that term, the truth. And they do have good intent there. So there were a number of uh, really great points that we've discussed already tonight. But for me, when I was praying about this and, and, and talking about or, or thinking about what, I'm, what I wanted to share in my conversion story, I feel like the Lord put two things on my heart that really had the most profound impact. And that is, before as a Jehovah's Witness, I was misled by two lies. The first one, that God's love is conditional. And the second lie, that God's mercy has limits. And since coming into the church, I've discovered and I I fully believe now that, that God's love is unconditional and his mercy is limitless. It's always there. Amen. And so I, I thank God, I praise him for, for bringing me to the fullness of truth in the Catholic Church. To talk about a little bit of, about my early childhood, my family wasn't very active from the time I was born to about maybe 10 years old. We would go to meetings on a semi-regular basis, and mostly my mom. And it was all I knew. And it didn't bother me that I didn't celebrate holidays or celebrate my birthday. So I've used the analogy before of uh, someone who's lactose intolerant. You go without milk, then you don't really miss it. So that wasn't really a big issue. I was very lonely as a child because uh, witness children are really isolated from schoolmates and, and other friends in their neighborhood, their own age. Parents are told uh, to keep their children away from such influences, as, as bad influences. Uh, um, as it was said before, people who are outside the cult are looked at as, as being influenced by the devil and a dangerous threat. And so you can imagine in a congregation of about maybe 70 people, there aren't many young people, and there certainly weren't many who were my age, so that was uh, one of the negative consequences. But later on, as I continued to grow, I, I really, two things, I love God and I love the Bible from an early age. And so I decided to, um, to be baptized or pseudo-baptized because they don't believe that Jesus is God when I was about 13 years old. And and basically what baptism is to a witness is being plunged underwater and you're agreeing to follow the Watchtower Society and their teachings. That's really highly stressed. So it's not not in the Trinitarian formula. After baptism, I I went through a really rough time in my teen years. I I suffered from long bouts of depression and feeling unworthy, feeling like, uh, like I had disappointed God. And life can be challenging for a teenager. And, and I sort of lived a double life for a number of years. I was involved in immorality. And, but I was, I was afraid to go to the elders and tell them what was going on. And the elders are the leaders in the congregation. 
I was afraid for uh, the consequences, which are very, very severe, very strong for a Jehovah's Witness. There's a, a potential shunning if you're disfellowshipped. Um, and there's also the humiliation that comes with being publicly reproved, where they make an announcement um, at one of their meetings that so-and-so ha- is being reproved, and obviously it's for some form of wrongdoing. So for fear of being exposed and for fear of the shunning, I kept it all in. I kept the poison of um, the life that I was living inside me, and I really felt cut off from God. It wasn't until later on, when I was maybe about 20 years old, that I I started to come through that. And it was at my lowest point that light started to shine through. God used that to bring me out of the cult. While I was going through this inner turmoil, I, I continued to put on the front of, try, of, of being a faithful Jehovah's Witness. I, uh, as I said, I pioneered. Um, I, was, I served as a ministerial servant in the congregation, which is uh, a loose equivalent to a, a deacon, someone who helps the elders out with congregation affairs. What, what moved me away, what, what got me interested in, in looking outside, it was a number of things, really. I think the biggest impact, or the, the biggest um, struggle that I had, was the witness view that very soon, very imminently, God is going to destroy countless billions of people because they're not faithful Jehovah's Witnesses. See, that's what they believe. Armageddon's going to come, and even, if, even among Jehovah's Witnesses, if you're not living a faithful life, then you will be destroyed and then cease to exist forever. And that just, deep down, it just doesn't, it, it, it doesn't feel right. That's, that's not the God of the universe, the God who created this world and all the people and, and that was huge. When I started looking into the Catholic Church, and I read one of the documents from Vatican II, Lumen Gentium, and uh, to uh, loosely paraphrase it, it says that um, those to who no fault of their own don't know the message of the gospel can still be saved based on them living lives according to their conscience, according to what they know. And that was a, that was a huge light that shined. That, that just made so much sense. That, of course, God's not going to destroy billions of people, many of whom may not have ever heard of the Watchtower or the circumstances in life just didn't uh, move them to want to become one of Jehovah's Witnesses. So it was like that in a number of areas. The more I learned about the Catholic Church, the more I realized I really didn't know anything at all about it. Because the, the image that the Watchtower portrays of the Catholic Church is really completely false, or at least twisted very much. And it's, it's one of the religions that's, uh, that's attacked more than any other in the literature. The beliefs of the Trinity, the immortality of the soul, the non-existence of hell. Uh, these things are, are, are really frequently discussed in the Watchtower. And witnesses are misinformed, as, as we talked about earlier, about what these teachings really are. So when I started to look into the Catholic Church, beforehand... When I, when I came to the conclusion that the watchtower was wrong, what next? Where do I go now? There came a point when I finally did something that I'd never really done before, and that was uh, I, I said a prayer to Jesus, asking him to, to lead me to, uh, to truth, or something like that. I can't even remember exactly the words I used, but I prayed to Jesus. And within a year, here I am, I became a Catholic. <laughs> So, <laughs> the more I learned about the Catholic Church, the more I fell in love with it and the teachings, and the more I read about the history of the Watchtower, the more I could see through its lies, its deceptions, the false prophecies, um, the other scandals that have taken place, and just the fact that here's a group that comes along in the late 1800s. They claim to know what the Bible means, how to, how to correctly interpret it, how to understand it. Yet what I, what I discovered was that all along from the very beginning, God already had a religion, a, a church, that was entrusted with the sacred words of truth. And, uh, and, and, and the evidence continued to point to the Catholic Church. Uh, from reading the early church fathers, I, I could very clearly see that they were Catholic. 
and reading other, um, other works, other books from the, the early Christian era, the first century, like the, the Didache, again, I, I kept seeing Catholic elements in there. Another point that I want to stress, though, is that it, it wasn't me. It wasn't, it wasn't my intellectual pursuit. It was really, I feel, God's grace that drew me to the Catholic Church. It, it drew me to the beauty of the Catholic Church. Because even before I, I started um, researching and, and looking into it, I was drawn to certain things like Gregorian chant, stained glass, the beautiful buildings, monasteries, and even the holidays, strangely enough, Christmas and Easter. <laughs> there was just something that really seemed nice, very, very comforting about those times of year. So little seeds that were planted from a young age that didn't, that didn't start to grow until later, but they, they did grow. And, and, and that's the thing uh, to keep in mind, that uh, if a witness comes to your door, you don't expect to change them overnight, but you could at least leave a seed that may sprout many years later, and they look back and remember. And, and that happened to me several times. Maybe about five years before I converted, I was going door to door, and I think it was a Catholic man that I met, and he left me with this question. He said, where did the Bible come from? And I hadn't given it much thought up until that point. You know, for a while, I, I sort of accepted the Watchtower interpretation or understanding of that, but it didn't satisfy that question. And later, when I, when I researched how the Bible came to be, how God used his church to compile these books by the Holy Spirit, that it just made more sense that the Catholic Church is the church that has the fullness of truth. Amen. And another very big impact um, on my life was two people that God sent into my neighborhood, who later became my godparents, very nice elderly couple who I started to call on. And they accepted the literature. They were very friendly. I, I, I developed a relationship with them. Uh, what I could see in their life was that they were, they were really content. They had a lot of peace, which, as a witness, you're, you're, you're sort of told that everyone outside doesn't have peace. They don't have um, the accurate knowledge of truth, and, and they're, they're miserable, more or less, or they have a false sense of peace. But I, I didn't see this with them. I saw that they truly had peace in their life. And so I think that also had a big impact in, in drawing me closer to the church, and, and eventually, when I came to the irrefutable conclusion that the Catholic Church is it, I went over to their house, and I, I just basically broke down and confessed to um, the lady who would become my godmother, the Catholic Church, that's, that's the full truth. And I think she was shocked at, at what I had to say. I, I, after all, I was trying to convert them, and, and here, <laughs> God was using them to convert me. There was a time... Uh, a few years ago, which allowed me to do deeper research and, and inner reflection when I was asked by a, a few friends of mine who were very devout Jehovah's Witnesses um, to watch their dog, watch their house and their dog that was injured because they were doing a missionary work and going around to different congregations. And this was out in Las Vegas. And, and, and so while I was there, I did more research about the Catholic Church and I picked up my first Catholic Bible and started reading it. And I, I really felt like now I have the full Bible, all the books, not just the 66 books, but the whole thing. It, it, it was also during this time that I, I went out in the field ministry for the last time. And I was sort of pressured to go because they had no idea. No one had any idea that I was going through this inside. I, I really uh, kept it quiet, except for my mother, who was also going through a bit of a hard time. And, and she was also on her way out, let's say. Um, at least in her heart. And so she was there for me. And it was a, a real blessing from God that I had someone to talk to and to, and to share what I was learning and what I was feeling, who I knew wouldn't run to the elders and, and tell on me. And then all the ramifications of that, of being hauled before a judicial committee, which you sit in a room with uh, three elders, and they ask you questions, interrogate you, uh, to decide what's going on, and then whether or not you're truly repentant according to how you come across to them. And then it's either disfellowshipping or, or some sort of reproof. So very, it's hard to explain, but being a Jehovah's Witness, it's, there's a lot of pressure put on you, a, a fear of talking too much or, or voicing doubts because of, of those consequences. But anyway, so I was talking about um, 
the last time I, I went out in the, in the ministry work going door to door, so I, I would go off by myself. Normally they go in pairs, twos or, or threes. But I, I didn't want to share what I knew was false with anyone. So I sort of just was walking down the road, pretending that I was doing it, but really just asking very vague questions. The last house that I went to, I found out it was a Catholic woman. And I asked her, I asked her this question, if, uh, if you could change one thing about the world today, what would it be? And her response really surprised me at the time. She said, I should go back to Mass. So I told her something like, good for you, and then left. <laughs> so there again, God continued to put Catholics in my life. Um, Catholics, uh, good examples of, of, uh, of Christian living, who were very kind, who set a good example, and that made a huge impact of all things. So even if you don't feel comfortable talking uh, with them immediately when they come, if you, if you want to spend some time doing some more research, at, at least by coming across friendly, by uh, treating them with respect and kindness, that can leave the biggest impact on them and, and potentially win them over to truth. When I, when I returned from Las Vegas, I had been wanting to go to a mass, but I, I hadn't built up the courage yet. Until finally, while I was still a witness, I prayed my first novena to St. Jude. <laughs> I also gave up something for Lent that year, which I, so I was, I was really getting into it and, and really loved the church, but, uh, but anyways, um, I prayed the novena and at the very end, God gave me the grace and the courage to finally go to Mass. It was a Friday morning, it wasn't a weekend Mass because I was afraid that someone might see me there and, and then report to someone if they knew a Jehovah's Witness and all the trouble that would bring. So I went Friday morning, and all my life I had been uh, instilled this fear of, of not going to any church because the witnesses say that they're under the control of, of the devil. But what I felt couldn't be farther from that, and, and it was really a profound sense of peace uh, when I walked into the church. I, I truly felt like this is the house of God, this is where God is present, even though I didn't really understand the Eucharist. I was really drawn to uh, a beautiful stained glass window in the church that showed Jesus in the boat saying, Come, be fishers of men. The beauty of, of this first Mass, hearing the hymns, hearing the alleluias, it was all, it was all a, a sensory overload in many respects, and I didn't know what was going on, but I, I loved being there and, and hearing it. And, uh, and, and how much the Bible was used, I was so shocked because... I had been told before this that Catholics don't know the Bible, that they don't read it, but I saw in the Mass that the Bible is used again and again. And that was, uh, that was really a great revelation that, that moved me closer to desire to join the church. And it was interesting that that day that I decided to attend Mass, there was Eucharistic adoration afterwards. So I, even more, the, the sense of God's presence there was, was, it was a very profound experience. So it didn't take me long. I, I went, I signed up for RCIA. I, I finally um, told my parents, and, and I'm a unique case, because in most cases, if someone leaves the, uh, the Jehovah's Witness religion, they're shunned by all their family and friends. And while, yes, I, I've been shunned by pretty much all of those people that I grew up with and, and thought were my friends and family, but my immediate family does not shun me. And so that's been a huge blessing, that they still talk to me um, and that they're still there for me. Going through the RCIA process continued to enrich my faith. It was more the community element, seeing the love that the Catholics who were involved in the parish um, showed to, to one another and, they, and the love that they had for the church and scripture. The big day came, the day of Easter Vigil of 2010. I received the, the three sacraments, baptism, confirmation, and first communion. I continued to have this hunger for the Eucharist as, as time went by. And it's, it's just such a blessing in coming into the church and, and, and feeling the difference from before and after. Before when I really felt abandoned, I didn't have God in my life. And then afterwards, to, to truly feel like a son of God. It's, uh, it's the greatest place to be, church. I'd like to finish by reading this verse from Matthew. Chapter 19, verse 29. 
For the Lord said, And everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or fathers or mother or children or fields for my name's sake will receive a hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. And that's truly how I feel. Coming into the family of the church, the communion of saints, those words were true uh, that Jesus promised. And it's a blessing to be here, be here now. It's a blessing to be home. Thank you very much. Aaron, have you um, tried to go back to your friends and other family members and so forth and to share with them the truth that you have learned, and have you had any success with that? Sadly, with the shunning, it's very hard to, uh, to communicate. They simply put, um, put a door up there. So like when I see a, a, a former friend of mine, they'll just walk right by, ignoring me that I'm even there. So it's, it's very hard. But when I left, um, which I, I didn't share with you, I basically um, just walked, I made an appointment to meet with the elders. And I walked in and, and handed them um, my resignation paper, saying that I no longer believed in the Watchtower Society and that I believed that the fullness of truth was in the Catholic Church. So in that sense, I tried to leave a witness with them. Um, and then afterwards, I had some negative um, remarks or comments that were sent my way uh, via uh, text messaging or, or emails. And so I tried to respond to some of those too. But uh, it, it's very difficult to, to breach that wall, especially if you're, if, if you're an ex-member. So that, therefore, it's, it's much better. You're in a much better position to reach them because they, you're looked at as a potential convert. I'm, I'm looked at as more of in league with the devil. So. Yeah, the point of shunning is very serious because if someone had spoken with him, they themselves could be disfellowshipped and shunned. So, and that goes also with books. They cannot read books by former Jehovah's Witnesses. So don't feel like you're going to pull out a, a great book and say, hey, read this. I won't read it. They can't. What about your parents? You said that you were able to share with them, but were they shunned because of your decision, or are they still able to support you? For a while, it did have a negative impact on them. Uh, certain ones in the congregation looked down on them for their decision to support me and to, uh, to continue to communicate with me. There's another thing is um, not every congregation is the same. So some are more strict about the rules and some are a little bit more relaxed. Thankfully the congregation I was from is more on the relaxed side so the elders didn't make much of a big deal about my parents shunning me. But they, they sort of have to some extent been um, less well received in the congregation. But I, I continue to pray and please pray for my family that they eventually come into the church. Aaron, um, is there a little speech that you have to give? Um, could you share a little bit of it? And how would you re respond as a Catholic today? They're trained during one of their meetings what to say at the door, how to respond to potential conversation stoppers, as they're called. They have many books. Um, they have a school in their kingdom hall that's devoted to teaching them how to um, evangelize. So as Deacon Carnazzo said, they're very well trained in, in how to uh, speak to those at the door. I'd like to add just one point to that. As Aaron had mentioned, usually two or three will come, and they come as, uh, as a team of usually, as I have found at least, a, a strong man, a, a man that's, that's mature in the watchtower and one that's weaker, one that's just kind of coming along, usually a, a younger person that uh, may, may know his stuff but maybe not as confident in speaking so you're actually, when you're talking with them, you're not discussing on a one-on-one -on -one basis. You're talking about taking on a team. The only way I've found to get anywhere, and I, I'm, this is my own experience again, uh, is to be quick enough to bring down the strong man's argument faster than the weak man can present him with the, with the books. And then I'm able to turn to his partner, who I figure I can make as much influence with as possible, and then I can step between them and just speak one-on-one. -on -one. And I've had situations where guys are driving out of my driveway yelling to their partner, get in the car, get in the car. So, and if, if they say win the argument, if you will, try, try again. Invite them back, prepare yourself, and stick to the subject at hand. Discuss that subject and that subject alone. And maybe you'll have a chance in making a, an impact. I was just curious as to what the services are like. 
They have kingdom halls, as you probably know. They don't call them churches. And it's very much like a large lecture hall. There are no religious articles. No, well, sometimes there are pictures, but uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty plain. The elders generally give uh, talks on the platform, 15 minutes to half an hour. They have times devoted to studying the Watchtower magazine, and they have their own personal edition which comes each month that they no longer give to the public. And basically, the answers are in the paragraphs, and then there are questions asked at the end, so you, you answer with what's there. It doesn't really give you much opportunity to critically think on your own. In fact, critically thinking is very much encouraged to be avoided by Jehovah's Witnesses. Kingdom Hall, does it meet on, isn't it true that I don't, I'm not, they meet on Saturdays because of the Sabbath still? I think that's the Adventist. The, the Witnesses meet generally on Sunday and then one other day during the week. So the Sunday is, is a public talk, they call it, where an elder will come and, and give a 30-minute talk on Watchtower theology. Then they have a Watchtower discussion, question and answer. And then on some other night during the week, they'll come together and, uh, and share experiences that they've had in the field ministry. They'll also have their school, which has a number of talks, which you have to prepare to give anywhere between five to, five to ten minutes. So that's, a, that's another time consumer, is, is, is having to prepare these talks that are in line with Watchtower theology. What is the hierarchical structure of the Watchtower Society? Do they have like a prophet, like the Mormons, or a pope, or whatever, bishops, dioceses? That's what... They have what's called the governing body, who live in Brooklyn, New York, at, at the world headquarters, which is also called Bethel. They're a group of elders who claim to be of the 144,000, so the ones who they say are going to heaven with the anointed. And under them, there are district overseers and circuit overseers who are traveling elders who go around to visit different congregations to oversee what's going on. And then under that, there are the, the local kingdom halls where you have the elders and then the ministerial servants. How successful are they in converting people and, say, especially the Catholics? Uh, that's a good question. Sadly... Many Jehovah's Witnesses are also Catholics, brought up in the faith. Some really good friends of mine were, were brought up in the Catholic faith, and it's, it's sad to see that, that they were swept up into this. And I think mostly because of not appreciating what they have. If they really knew what they had to begin with, which is also another important reason to, to grow in the faith and to really appreciate it um, so that you don't lose it, as, as many Catholics have. Okay, we're going to finish up there because we're getting uh, late. Again, we just em emphasize that there are a lot of resources out there. St. Joseph's Communication has a lot of great information by Mary Woodward Cochin, former Jehovah's Witness convert, and goes through in quite a lot of detail. I would just emphasize to you in closing that y you have to be prepared. And Catholics aren't used to being prepared. You may not convert them that day. You may never convert them. But you might plant a seed and let Jesus do the rest of the work. Amen? Amen. All right. We'll see you next week for the Seventh-day Adventists in the week following for the Mormons. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed this presentation from the Institute of Catholic Culture. If you'd like to learn more about the mission of the Institute and how you may become a part of this important work, please visit our website at www.instituteofcatholicculture.org or call us at 540-635-7155. And may the glory of Christ Church be ever more manifest upon the earth. St. John the Evangelist, pray for us.